Hello, and welcome to Wooly Wednesday. I'm Cindra Kirscher, Program Coordinator for the Shave and the Saving Program of the Livestock Conservancy and Wooly Wednesday host. And I'm super excited today to introduce our guests all the way from Cusco, Peru, Abby Frankmont. Hi, Abby. Hello, everybody. Uh, great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I, the, the Livestock Conservancy is super cool and the Shave Them to Save Them program is extremely important. And saving rare breeds is a big deal. It's a big deal having uh, lots of diversity in our fiber and in the livestock that exist and are available is really, really cool. So um, anyway, I, we have a few different things to talk about. Lots of different stuff we could talk about. Uh, sometimes folks tell me, that I could probably talk forever. And uh, you know, one time someone said, I would even take a class with you if it was about boiling water. And you know, I'm sad to say that that actually launched into a discussion of boiling water because uh, I live at high altitude. Um, I live at two different high altitude points. Um, uh, here in Cusco, Peru, I am at about 11,500 feet above sea level. And in Ollantaytambo, which is the other place that I spend most of my time, my other main home, uh, I'm at about 9,500 feet above sea level. And this means that uh, the boiling point of water is different and it takes longer. So if I put the kettle on here in Cusco, uh, my two liter kettle takes about 20 minutes to come to a boil because it is, um, it is, uh, 88 degrees Celsius, the boiling point here. So even though it is lower because the air pressure is less at high altitude, it takes longer to come to a boil. And then people are like, well, I never knew that. And then, well, wait a minute, how's that? How's this relevant to yarn? Why are we even talking about this with respect to yarn? And the answer is because dyeing yarn can be entirely different when the boiling point is different. Wow. And a lot of stuff so there you go so anyway that was just uh, uh supposed to be a cute aside to say that yeah you know come on bring them on you got you got questions um i'm always interested you never know right right uh, Abby, I, let, me, let me sneak in real quick and introduce vampy too hey vampy vampy is faculty at abbyjarns.com adjunct faculty and she is joining today and helping with some tech for abby and i so welcome abby and Abby is actually joining us from the UK, right? Uh, yes, I am the opposite of Abby. I am in Norfolk at sea level, uh, as, as low as you can get in the flattest part of the country. <laughs> well, welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Right, it's lovely to be here. I want to do a quick couple of shout outs for Abby before we get too far into conversation and I forget. If you want to go search an Abby out and her, her university out after the chat today, you can reach her at www.abbyjarns.com. And I am spelling these out because this will be broadcast on Podbean, where these links will not actually be visible. Her Facebook page is facebook.com slash abbyjarns, A-B-B-Y-S-Y-A-R-N-S. And... Email faculty at abbyjarns.com, F-A-C-U-L-T-Y at A-B-B-Y-S-Y-A-R-N-S.com. These are always a mouthful to run through. You can find Abby at Abby's Yarns uh, on Twitter, forward slash Abby's Yarns, TikTok at Abby's Yarns. And also, she has a very extensive YouTube library. Also youtube.com forward slash Abby's Yarns. So I love how consistent it was. Anywhere you go, Abby's Yarns will get you there. <laughs> we try, we try. Um, and it used to be, it used to be I try. And then uh, recently over the past couple of years, um, I have, I have help coming in. Uh, folks like Vampy in the UK, and uh, I have uh, another uh, adjunct professor in the Netherlands, and two more who are in different time zones in the USA. And so we have folks pretty much around the clock who can be helping out in a variety of different ways with a lot of different stuff. And this is important because um, we do a whole lot via my uh, private and public like some, some areas are subscriber only, but there are some that are, you know, open to the general public who have actually joined the server on Discord, which is a chat platform. And if you are there on my website at abbysyarns.com, 
there are uh, there are some uh, options across the top and uh, under interact one of them is chat and that is going to be your quickest way to find and interact with me and my community of spinners weavers yarn enthusiasts fiber fanatics and <laughs> A fanatic in the in the kindest and most uh, appreciative way. Um, we are there 24-7 and around the globe, which is really pretty cool because we have a whole lot of perspectives and a whole lot of interesting stuff going on. Um, did you want me to go ahead and introduce myself more or uh, how do we want to start? I do, but I want to just give a quick plug. We've got a bunch of people who've signed in already and are joining us and saying hello. So Margo, Janet, thank you so much. Someone has given a shout out to the Discord community saying they're amazing. Unfortunately, their name has not come through from Facebook, but Nancy, hi, Nancy. So all of you that are just tuning in or that will tune in, please go ahead and say hello. Tell us where you're from, post your questions and we will get to them before the end of the chat because I know you probably have lots of questions. Right now, I want to know, Abby, how you met your very first spindle. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I didn't, I probably never stood much of a chance on all of this. Uh, my, my parents were uh, anthropologists and also fiber enthusiasts. And so uh, they actually met in Peru uh, in their undergraduate college years and uh, kept coming back here to, to work. It was always my mother's dream to live and work in the Cusco area and with Cusco women who were weavers and spinners in particular. Her mom having been an art teacher who was a spinner and weaver and knitter and all of this kind of stuff. And her mom in turn was a, uh, a, a, a sewer and knitter and weaver and all of this kind of stuff. So I, I really didn't have much of a chance. And my very first memory, my oldest memory, is actually of crawling inside the um, 1700s colonial barn room that my parents had set up in Massachusetts at that point in time, falling asleep and waking up to watch the sunlight filter down through the, uh, through the sheds as they opened and closed and all of that sort of thing. So I, I didn't have much of a chance. But when I was four years old, uh, we moved to uh, Chinchero, Cusco, Peru, which is now about a half an hour from here where I live uh, in Cusco. And at the time, it was more like three to four hours in the back of a cattle truck or about five to six hours walking. But, you know, roads have improved substantially since then. Uh, anyway, so we settled down there and started working in the town that took us in, did so largely because they liked my mom. Uh, my mom had been studying Quechua, the indigenous language here for some time, and she had already been living in the area and working here, and my dad sort of kept following her around because you know, he was quite enamored of her and everything. Uh, and so anyway, the, the indigenous community there in Chinchero took a look at my mom and thought she was a nice lady and a good person. And they were like, and she's got this husband and who knows what his capabilities are, are. we'll have to figure that out, but she's got these two kids and how are they supposed to live or survive if we don't help out? So they decided to, uh, they had a town meeting and all agreed that they would rent my family a, a house, a place to live for my parents to do some of the work that they wanted to do at that point. And by this time I had turned five years old and everybody in the community was very concerned about this because I was now, I had just turned five and um, I, didn't, I didn't spin at all. And Chinchero is a spinning and weaving community, plus lots of other fiber arts, but those sort of primarily. And they were very concerned that I was really, you know, getting old without, you know, learning how to spin. So they were like, if we don't take her in hand quickly, we're not going to be able to, to mitigate this, right? So essentially the entire community put me on uh, an intervention plan, right? Uh, and uh, they got me started spinning, and I was terrible at spinning. I was pretty good at weaving, which was age appropriate for me to begin learning. But in order to earn the weaving yarn that I needed in order to keep learning how to weave and so forth, you know, I mean, I had to be a participant in the yarn production situation, right? So, uh, so I, I had to do a whole lot of plying. But anyway, um, I was I was given my first spindle. And it was, uh, it was a standard Andean pushka, which means spindle in Quechua. And uh, 
uh, put on the intervention plan, and they, they all thought that if the whole community just kept working really hard on getting me on the right track, then by the time I was eight, I might no longer need to pull out special services. And they were right, but it did take that long. So anyway, when people um, in, in Chinchero found out that I had become a spinning teacher in the U.S. and elsewhere in the world, in the English-speaking world primarily, uh, all of my childhood friends said, you know, no offense, but like in the States, are they really hard up for spinning teachers? And I had to say, well, yes, as a matter of fact, actually, yes, they kind of are. And then my friend said, yeah, but I guess on the other hand, you know, you came to it so late in life um, that that you remember learning how to do these things. And you were so bad at it that that probably also makes you sympathetic to people who are also learning later in life. So I, I guess I guess I can see that. Like, wow, can you can you imagine like. What's that like? And I, I so, so this is some of what I thought we'd talk about a little bit today is sort of the juxtapositions in, in spinning and weaving and knitting and doing all that kind of stuff between life here in Peru and life in the uh, more industrialized world that has been industrialized for longer because um, those forces are uh, still sort of freshly in play here in a lot of Peru. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a great plan. And at some point, you're going to interject and talk about how you got got to here? Oh, you know, I've read that book, but like, <laughs> I swear, I didn't, anything new from it, right? Um, <laughs> actually, what's really funny is every so often I do go through and read something in there, and I'm like, oh, wow, I, I like the way she phrased that, you know, she being, you know, me 13 years ago or whatever. Uh -huh. um, uh, but but it is really it, it is really sort of interesting. I think my funniest story about all of that is after the book came out. After the book came out, uh, I said to my mother, you know, who was a uh, a PhD and uh, teacher in university settings and other kinds of stuff. I said, so now that I have this book, like one of the things that I could do with it is I could tell people who want to take classes with me that they should like buy the book and then we can use it as a reference material. And she's like, Abby, this is brilliant. Why has no one ever thought of this? Like, yeah, okay. Okay. And she's like, except you, you kind of missed the mark with this because you should have published it with a different, with an academic, you know, with Wiley and Sons yeah. and charged $300 for it and had it be like on a lot of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, college course listings and everything. And I was like, well, you know, when we reach a point where you can do that kind of in-depth education and spinning, and she's like, yeah, you're going to have to like roll your own on that one because, because this is a tough road to hoe. She having been an anthropologist with a heavy focus on textiles, um, you know, mm -hmm. she maybe knew what she was talking about there. Yeah. Maybe just a little. <laughs> maybe just well, a little. I, I wanted to make sure we talked about this book because I think as I told you in my email, my intro email to you, and I asked if you'd be interested in, in joining me, I told you I bought this book because I didn't know how to spin. And I wanted, to, I didn't even know about spindles. Like I didn't know there was a top whirl and a bottom whirl and that they had different weights and that there were all these different kinds of spindles from across the world. And that depending on what you wanted to spin, you might pick a different spindle, which is one of the great things about this. You put a spindle matrix in here with, and I, I can't tell you, I can't find it at the moment to share it, but here it is. Based on the type of yarn, and of course you know what you put in your book, but I'm sharing this for everybody watching. Do I? Do I know? <laughs> Based on your yarn objective, you talk about spindle choices, drafting method, weight, excuse me, rate of twist. I mean, it's is fabulous for a beginner or I think an advanced spinner. I am not. Thank I'm you. Not, you're welcome. No, it's really well done. And the photo tutorials in here are fabulous. Like that's really. I, I, have to say, I, I, I really want to give a whole lot of credit to editor Anne Marrow, who is now one of the uh, key folks at Long Thread Media. And uh, uh, she, she and I worked really closely uh, on, on this book. And she gave me a whole lot of latitude to decide how we were going to do the step-by-step -step photos. And, and, um, uh, and I don't think all editors would have done that. And I think the book is so much stronger because of that, because mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I want to show this, this, and this, and here are the things I want, like in the step outs for it. 
And then she could look at it and say, no, that doesn't quite work. We need to do this other kind of stuff. And we did a whole lot of iteration on that. And I really think that that is a lot of why that book came out well, because one of the things that was interesting when we were doing the photography for it and everything is that if you're spinning with other kinds of equipment, you can kind of pause and hold this position and uh, hang on right there. But with a spindle, you pretty much can't. And so, um, and so uh, Ann Swanson, who is doing the photography, said this was more like sports photography, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, mm -hmm. than than it is your sort of standard step outs of kind of stuff. So it was really interesting, and I actually learned a lot writing that book, uh, including I had to take a calculus class, which <laughs> I did not expect. And uh, then I learned that the calculus class was not enough, and the physics that I wanted to include was too complicated. Um, and that, uh, and that actual literal rocket scientists were like, no, we, no, no, we would potentially describe something after the fact using physics terms, being able to describe it, but with the range of variability and everything that's possible, this is outrageous beyond science fiction. I went through multiple physicists working on all of this and the whole thing. Ultimately it came down to what I had to do was describe the tendencies right um and talk about the physics premises and what you need to understand and how those sort of things interact but i couldn't give like ready formulae uh or what have you and i was super disappointed because i wanted it to be i wanted it to be like that sort of 1950s pulp science fiction story where the nerdy kid um suddenly joins the football team and can throw the football brilliantly because he understands how to like make the arc whatever right and i wanted to, to do that but like for making string with a stick and it, it didn't quite work out so um but then realistically it probably didn't actually work out that way in the 1950s pulp science fiction story um so you know it is mm -hmm. what it is it is what it is well it worked <laughs> out well maybe, maybe it wasn't your original plan but it worked out really well let me see quick if we have any questions. Mm -hmm. uh, Kim is checking in from Solitude Wool. Hi, Kim. Hi, Margaret Matthews. Thanks for joining us. Di Danielle's here from New Hampshire. There was a question about plying, but it's unclear what the question is. It just says plying question mark. So I'll let you come back with more detailed question. Um, best spindle book ever, Anne Krieg. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Um, I miss you, Anne. Um, I, I do miss everybody in the U.S. who I was always seeing at fiber shows and events and stuff like that. And it has been really sad these past few years not to be doing it. Um, I thought when I moved home to Peru that I would just be going a couple of times a year to the U.S. and doing my favorite shows that were my can't miss shows. And then this whole pandemic thing happened. And then like all of this other stuff. And so you know, for the time being, I'm, I am uh, enjoying the lingering effects of uh, long COVID uh, fatigue and, uh, and other such sequelae, and I don't get to travel. So I've now spent uh, two and a half years stuck in the same 150 kilometer radius, which is really interesting considering that I used to travel all over the world. Um, and the, the truth is, you know, if I had to pick uh, a specific 150 kilometer radius to be stuck in, stuck it would definitely be this one because we have pretty much everything that you could possibly want except the seashore but that's okay because i'm really pale and i sunburn easily so you know that's so that's fine um but yeah it's we we really have pretty much everything here and it's a it's a wonderful combination synthesis of uh, the ancient and the modern and uh, all of that and because cusco is a center for tourism there are people here from all over the world and so it's a uh, it's there it's just a terrifically eclectic place to live and for example my nephew who is uh, in culinary school um with dreams of becoming a fusion chef and all of that sort of stuff like every so often i get to take him to try some new kind of cuisine that he has never experienced and we pretty much have it all here in cusco except we don't really have the midwestern usa potluck so that is actually one of the places where I am sometimes able to provide some cult cultural interchange to some extent, you know, where I can say, oh, wait, I'm, this is this is pasta salad, right? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so let's let's chat about your your uh, 
your program, abbeysyarns.com, and your tutorials on there. Mm -hmm. I have a question about teaching little ones to spin. Some of, someone has, a viewer has a three-year-old and a one-year-old. Do you have well. any... <laughs> well, right. Have all kinds of things. So actually, the um, the the video clip that I thought we might share um, uh, at, at some point, um, when it seems opportune, um, Cindy, I'll let you choose when that is. Uh, okay. From my YouTube channel is how to make yarn with a pencil, and that is actually a method of teaching the basics of spinning that is used to teach toddlers here in the Andes because you can do it sort of by demonstration and with minimal verbal input it is essentially playing and it is not particularly high stakes right uh, mm -hmm. i mean the, yes the risk is that you're going to lose a little bit of fiber but it's pretty much okay and andean kids in spinning and weaving communities are exposed to fiber stuff from birth right because they are carried around on their mom's backs their moms wear them in a lichlia or manta or keparina which is the word for the carrying cloth that uh children go in and so they're sort of watching their moms and the world around them and everybody do stuff and so forth. Um, and in the very beginning, babies are swaddled like real tight uh, and kept and kept uh, comfortable and warm and strong that way is, is the perception. But then as they reach sort of uh, almost toddler point, then they're a bundle of grabbing hands, right? Like on your back and so they grab stuff and they're looking at things and they grab stuff. So you give, you give your baby a little bit of wool and they play with that that wool, you know, just fidgeting with it. And it's amazing how much you actually learn in that tactile way by playing with wool, by physically having your hands in the wool, right? And sometimes people say, but, but aren't they going to try to eat it? Yep. <laughs> Guaranteed. Now they know what lanolin tastes like. Um, you know, so it's, it's you know, the, the, it, it's harder than you might think for a baby to like choke on a lock of wool. Um, I've never heard of it happening, uh, like at all. And and they don't really try to swallow it or anything, but you know, nah, 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 you know, so you learn a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and, then, and then they get, after a bit, you know, when they're sort of uh, toddler aged and they can be toddling around, running around, in order to keep them out of trouble and near you while you are tied up to your backstrap loom doing your weaving, um, you give your baby a stick as well, your toddler a stick, and then they kind of sit there and go and copy what they've seen other people do leading up to this and so forth. And uh, and then and then you know, show them this wrapping method. And this is in this is in the how to make string with a stick, how to make yarn with a stick video that mm -hmm. talks about it. And they begin to understand how twist moves through fiber and how you can pull fiber apart. And this becomes this really intuitive thing where uh, it's possible to do. And I think, I think part of the issue with teaching little kids is that little kids want to do whatever they see bigger kids and grown-ups doing. Um, that is how uh, early childhood learning most happens, is that they want to copy what they see modeled for them. And it's informative because this actually can reflect a lot back to you because you may learn what those little kids are seeing and that may uh, inform you about what it is that you are doing or appear to be doing. For instance, mm -hmm. I remember one time when my kid was very little, uh, they were they were working on building a, like a Duplo block structure and it wasn't going together the way they wanted. And they went, huh, this was pre-verbal times. They went, huh, and they walked over to the bookshelf of their, of their books, pulled down a board book and sort of flipped through it and went, hmm, walked back over to sit by the Legos, right? And we're flipping through it and they went, huh, hmm. And now this was like, I don't know, the teeny tiny farm or something. This was nothing to do with building things with Legos, but it was a book, right? And so what my kid had internalized was, you go look for a reference product in a book, you refer to that, and then you are you are iterating, right? So, so, so that was clearly something that I had modeled for my kid without realizing. Mm -hmm. Oh, huh. that's a good, that's a good thing to model. I think I've probably, <laughs> probably modeled a few things that I shouldn't have. <laughs> and, you know, I, the, that, it happens. I choice language. I there right. might, there might have been a few things, right? But um, yeah. I think it's really interesting. So, so the big thing is 
um, as far as teaching little kids, you have to make it low stakes, you have to make it feel like play, you have to give them materials that are going to be theirs, and you have to not sort of set an expectation that they're suddenly going to produce yarn. You know, wait until they're really old, like five, um, and uh, then you can start, you know, hitting them with the, the weight of your expectations. And, no, 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 that came out sounding all wrong. Um, but uh, but it's it's different in, in agricultural society. And actually, it's changed a lot in the Andes over the, you know, 50 years of my life, because, you know, in the beginning, you know, you, you, little kids out in indigenous communities were not being sent to school. There weren't schools. And then in the 70s, schools started being built up. And then more and more kids started going to school routinely. And by the 1980s, like almost all the kids were going to school. By the 1990s, they absolutely all are. And so this means that the environments that kids are in are very different. So instead of learning sort of incorporated with family life, um, now it needs to be more concentrated and focused points. But if, if you're looking at teaching your own kids in your familial setting, then, then uh, the how to make yarn with a pencil video is a great thing to work through with the techniques in that and to have your kids there with you um, playing with that as you do it. And, uh, and so that is, uh, that is on the YouTube channel. I don't know if, uh, let's go ahead uh, and show it. Okay. Do you have it? Do you have it queued up or? Vampy, have you pulled it up? If not, I can pull it up. I'm not sure who's easiest to screen share it other than not me. <laughs> um, considering. I'll read a couple of comments while Vampy, I think Vampy is looking for it. So someone said, let me scroll back up. Oh, Kat's finally watching. She's not driving. Hi, Kat. Thanks for joining. Um, where did that just go? Oh, Margo. Hi, Margo. She says, I would have loved to have learned to spin when I was five. So many more years of spinning. Yeah, even just sitting a toddler down and spinning and having them participate at any level involves them and they can feel as if they are spinning yarn. It's such a good way to interact and get to know, just sitting with, an, a, chi with a child for an extended period of time and talking, interacting. It's how I got to know my great niece on a recent visit. I since sent a video using the same Turkish spindle. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's so much that's... Uh... There's so much that's really that's that's really interesting when it comes to all of that kind of stuff. But mostly, little kids want to be doing what you're doing, and they want to be doing uh, what bigger kids are doing. So, like I know uh, my kid, for example, uh, learned to walk practically overnight when they saw their cousin that was 15 months older than them walking and running around. They were like, "I, I could be doing that," and so they did. Right. You know, so um, so it's it's really interesting. There's there's a lot of theory and a lot of interesting stuff about early childhood education and a lot of stuff about teaching hands on skills and practice based skills. And I've put a lot of time and energy into studying a lot of those things, the pedagogical and andragogical uh, type approaches to doing a lot of these things. And ultimately, I have to say, whatever can be made to feel enjoyable and like fun and like it isn't stressful is what tends to really stick. And, uh, and so that's, that's a lot of what's gone into developing uh, my methodology and my approach to a whole lot of this kind of stuff. But I think, I think that sometimes um, when we are thinking about teaching our, our own children how to do something, uh, two key things come in. And one of them is expectations, both on the part of ourselves and on the part of the kid in terms of what is going to be possible. And the other is the idea that a result should happen. And, you know, if we look at a lot of different things that, you know, that I did uh, growing up, um, they didn't produce a particularly tangible result. And I'm thinking about, you know, my mom a couple months before she passed away holding up um, in front of me a sweater, well, okay, half of the back of a cardigan that I started knitting when I was eight. And she would pull that out every so often, like, I notice you haven't finished this yet, right? And um, for all different kinds of reasons. And, and that time when she pulled it out, she said, and I, I noticed you still haven't finished this. So you know, do you have anything to say about that? And I said, listen, I know we bought 
enough yarn to complete that project, but it was to fit an eight-year-old me. And I don't presently have an eight-year-old that I want to knit a cardigan for. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's a thing. But mm -hmm. for another thing, yeah, I, I'm, I'm on other projects now and the yarn isn't even all that great. And so like, what's, what's your point here? And she said, okay, well, actually my point was, I wanted to see if it was time to give you this project yet. And she opened up this box. And fortunately, my great grandmother had purchased enough yarn to finish the project because it was a crocheted bedspread. And my great grandmother had started it. Her daughter, my grandmother, had walked, uh, had, had worked on it as well. And uh, then my mother had, and my mother said, So I guess now it's your turn to not finish this project. Um, very <laughs> cool. Isn't that cool? <laughs> yeah. Very, very cool. Hey, Vampy gave me the link to the video. So let me go ahead and try and share this real quick. Don't share very often. So we'll see how this goes. Here's hoping. Yeah. I'm the thing that's different Oops. about a Virgo no. vacation home, you always have the whole place to mute the ad because I really don't want that. <laughs> Pause there and let me see if I can share it. Share, share screen. Share screen. Right. Well, if the screen share doesn't work, then we can just refer everybody to that video. Um, it's right here. Do you see it? Yep. All right, I'm gonna hit play. And I think you can make it full screen maybe. Yes. Oh, but I muted it, hang on. Okay, there we go. Hello, I'm Hanson, I'm teacher Abby Franklin, and I'm here today to teach you a very, very basic way to start spinning your own yarn. We are going to go through a couple of different fibers, talk a little bit about identifying the fibers that you've got and what they should act like, and then we are going to teach you how to make yarn with a pencil. So, a number two pencil. and some fiber. And this is the fiber that we will be using, but I'm going to show you a couple of other pieces of fiber that have some problems. This fiber is spinnable, but it's very hard to tug apart. It's become lightly felted. It takes a lot to pull it apart. So that's not awesome. That's not our top pick for learning to spin fiber. So we're going to start with this. This is Corydale wool combed top. That means all the fibers are aligned parallel. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to tear a strip off the side. And set the rest aside for now. As you can see, when I tug on these fibers, they drift right apart. They come mm. right apart. Wow. So they're obviously not going in. So to begin with, you can kind of go over this and tug gently just to move fibers apart to feel where things actually slip past each other. And I'll explain why this works. It's because of the staple length of the fibers. To show staple length, I have here some freshly shorn wool locks. Right here is the end that was attached to the sheet where it was shorn or cut. And here is the end where it was cut the prior year. So this is as long as the sheep's wool grew in between shearings. And we typically call this the staple length, S-T-A-P-L-E. And basically what it means is the typical length of the fibers in your mass. You can really see what they are here with this wool lock right in front of you. With the dye fibers that have already been processed, it can be a little harder to see. So the way you check the staple length is to grab just a few fibers, sort of from the end of the mass, and pull them out, and you can take a look at them. And you can see that they're about this long. So if you're holding closer together than that, you can't get these fibers to slip past each other. You need to be holding around a staple length, if not a little bit more apart, so that fibers will keep drifting. Now, fibers drifting apart, you probably noticed, doesn't make yarn. What does make yarn is if twist goes into them and then locks them together. 
I'll show it again with the white fiber. Drifting, it just drifts apart. But now if I put some twist into it, you can see it gets thinner, and eventually it doesn't pull apart once I have enough twist. So we're going to show you this method of doing this very quickly and easily using just a pencil. So here's our strip of fiber, and here's our pencil. We're going to hold the pencil like this. We're going to put one hand out in front of us. This can be either hand with your palm down. So your thumb should be facing the inside of your body towards your middle. Okay. Now place the pencil in your hand and kind of grasp it like so. Like here, we are horizontal, and now we're vertical. Horizontal and vertical, and this will become important later. Now, place your thumb gently against the shaft of the pencil. Place one end of your strip of fiber in between your thumb and the pencil. Mm -hmm. So now that we've got our thumb holding the fibers gently to the pencil, I'm gonna kind of go like this and measure from here to here. In other words, from my hand down to my elbow, we're gonna call this a cubit. And I'm gonna pinch right here by my elbow. And then that allows me to have about this distance, which is kind of, uh, if my shoulders are, if my hands are about shoulder width apart, that's kind of, that's kind of where we're at. So this is a good, way to measure this if you're looking for a ballpark uh, on how far you want your hands to be out before we start our next step. Okay, so now that I've got that measured distance, I'm ready to take it to the next step. Be careful though, because if I kind of stretch and pull while I'm doing this, everything's going to just come right apart. So I'm going to set up again, make sure I've got around that measured distance, around that cubit, and I'm going to just wrap. I'm holding one end the spindle uh, to the stick, the pencil, and I am just wrapping. Now notice that I am not pulling and my fingers eventually come in contact with the pencil. My pinching fingers come in contact with the pencil. At this point, I turn vertical and I twirl the pencil and gently tug off the side. And as you can see, some twist has gone into hmm. these fibers, locking them together. So now I can scoot my hand out a little bit further and that twist kind of follows and then go back to this wrapping maneuver. Vertical. And this time when I come off the side, I'm not going to pull past this first fuzzy bit. And I'm going to leave what's already there being water under the bridge, yarn that spun and wrapped around the stick. I'm going to wrap again and pull off, and you can see even more twist has gone in. Now holding this gently, if I relax my grip and gently slide, you can see that twist follow my pinching finger over here. And I've made more yarn and moved the twist down into new fiber. Now I'm going to wrap again. Turn, come off the side and then move that out into new fiber. And this is making very thick yarn very slowly, but this also works faster and un under other circumstances. So let's say that I pile up a whole lot of twist in just one little length. See how it kinks back up on itself? That's normal and it's supposed to. So it kinks back up on itself. What I can do now is put the pencil down just rest it, bring my other hand up here. And so long as I am about a staple length apart, as long as my hands are about a staple length apart, I can pull these fibers out thinner. And then I can let that twist move out into those new fibers and make thinner yarn. So why does this work? Well, I'm going to demonstrate using a common piece of household technology. You've probably seen some of these devices before. If it is mounted on a bracket so that it rotates, then what pulls off the side is a flat sheet. If you roll 
so that you're winding on from the side. Again, what you get is a flat sheet. On the other hand, let's suppose that you put it right here and you kind of pull off the end. Well, now as it comes off the end, twist is going into it. Whether you go off the end or around the end, you will be adding or subtracting twist. So same thing here. If I don't do anything to change what's going on, and this is going to twist up as I wrap. And so this is basically just taking advantage of those simple premises in order to put twist into fibers and turn them into yarn, like we have here. And so now that you've got some yarn wrapped around a pencil, there are still more steps. If you're looking for more information, you can find lots more on my website at abbeysyarns.com or in my book, Respect the Spindle. Thanks for watching. That was great. Now, who knew that you could actually spin with a pencil? <laughs> <laughs> you make it look so easy. Well, it, could be, it could be a rock. It could be all kinds of stuff. But this is this is that is a slow breakdown of, uh -huh. that, that is used to teach people to teach children, toddlers in the Andes, how to make yarn, right? How to manage twist and fiber at the same time. And that's a good way. That's a good way to make a lot of thick yarn slowly. It's a good way to put things in slow motion. And this is one of the things that is, like I was saying, talking about the step-by-step -step photography for Respect the Spindle um, mm -hmm. and how that was a challenge because it was more like sports photography. Uh, it's hard, right? Twist moves at the speed of twist. And usually when I say that, someone's like, well, is that like the speed of sound or the speed of light? And I'm like, it's way worse than that because it's the speed of twist, which when you're learning how to spin is either glacially slow or it's faster than anything and it's just going to get all up in everything you don't want it to be in. And until you can learn how to control that, spinning is going to continue to be hard. Whatever the equipment is that you're using, whether it is the mighty stick or pencil as demonstrated in that case, uh, or a really high-end spinning wheel or motorized spinner or uh, a lot of this different kind of stuff, it's all the same. Spinning yarn is about managing twist. Yarn is a byproduct of you working with twist and controlling it, generally with your hands. And, um, you know, and that's, there, there are sometimes there are additional accessories and tools and other kinds of things. And sometimes you may have, you know, a bad ouchy hand. I have a bad ouchy hand right now and I'm not allowed to spin for a little bit. I'm so mad about it. I'm so mad about it. Like, really? You know, really? Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be still off of spinning until, uh, until September because uh, I have um, an exciting new thumb tendonitis. Well, we hope, we hope that uh, you rest up and we'll be spinning again after, after I recovery. Yeah, I, I will. I will. I have a, I have a really good uh, orthopedic sports rehab guy and and, and he's excellent. He's just, um, but you know, he's a, he, he mainly works with athletes. And so he's very, he's very blunt, very to the point. And he's like, well, you want to continue doing this. So now you have to stop for a little while until we get that all sorted. Mm -hmm. So what is just sort of curiosity? I mean, I know you learned with a very primitive tool early on, but what is your, and I guess, you know, thinking back to the matrix, it depends on what you want to spin, but like, what is your go-to spindle? Is it a top whirl and is it a bottom whirl? Is it, you know? It's, it's the one I have to hand, generally speaking. Um, yeah. But that being said, I, that being said, I am, I am really fond of the, you know, very standard Andean spindles that we have here. I should have had one in arm's reach. I don't know why I didn't. Um, uh, but they are, they are very lightweight. They're about this long and, uh, um, uh, um, and they weigh like 10 to 20 grams usually and stuff. And so when they're really light, they are, um, they're better for spinning thinner yarns. Yes. And if they take more expertise to use really effectively, but they all are also a lot less wear and tear on your body and a lot less strain on your body. And I know I'm saying that as I'm sitting here telling you that I have thumb tendonitis right now that I am 
you know, being required to not spin in treatment of. And listen, let's just let's just face facts. You know, as you uh, are no longer 19, you know, the years go marching by. Um, many things about you know our human bodies uh, start to do lots of different things, like be not as awesomely reliable and dependable as when we were young. And so in order to keep doing that kind of stuff, it takes, it takes putting a lot in. So I like lightweight spindles because they don't make me exhausted and tired. And um, uh, I like spindles that make me go, ooh, pretty. I just want to have that in my hands. There and, are gorgeous uh -huh. spindles out there. Really. They're really, mm -hmm. they really are. And I like ones that are really simple. I like, I like, I like a spindle that feels good in the hand. So I like to hold it and fidget with it and play with it. I don't like for spindles to have too slick of a shaft. I don't like too thick of a shaft. And this is where, you know, I, I always find that um, when I look at what the search terms are that bring people to my website and my blog, uh, there, I, there are search terms, there, there are things I never expected. And it's probably because I was talking about like fingertips gripping the shaft up near its tip and stuff like that and things, <laughs> you know. Um, you no know, idea so, what you're talking about. Yeah, right, no idea. So, so yeah, no idea. Uh, I also have no idea why through many, many cultures and much of human history, spinners and weavers have been thought of as uh, people with a body sense of humor and tellers of dirty jokes, but that, that does appear to commonly be the case. Um, and like I say, it's probably because we're talking about like tension and orifices and, you know, and when things are getting kinky, but um, you know, it's it's probably all that. So I, I I couldn't tell you that I have one specific favorite spindle, but I will sort of like go in waves. It's like it's like, do you have a favorite coffee cup or teacup? Probably. You should ask there. me that. <laughs> yeah. But then at the same time, you probably have more than one coffee cup, right? I do. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Do you, so is it the same cup for drinking coffee as it is for drinking like a really good tea or infusion? No. And, and, and sometimes you're like out and you're looking, you're looking at, at, you know, pottery or something. And there's this one, there's just, there's this one and you just, and it's, you mm -hmm. just really want it. Yeah. So, I mean, spindles are, are a lot like that. And also like if they're cool, like if they're just cool for some reason, and it could be all kinds of things. Like there are some spindles that uh, that that used to be common, and you can hardly ever find them anymore. And the one guy who was making them passed away from COVID, and so I, I've been trying to convince some people who know basically what he did to start making them again. And they're practicing up, but they haven't quite gotten there yet. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but where it has a captive ring that is carved from the same piece of wood that is turned from the same piece of wood that the main whorl is made from, so it rattles, uh, whirs as you spin, and it's wow. just it's just cool. There yeah. might be, there might be a couple of those in stock on my website still, um, but I I um, uh, you know the the guy didn't the guy before he passed away, he didn't want to make a whole ton of them. So I managed to convince him to make me a bunch of them by, uh, by, by paying exorbitantly for them and so forth. And then, and then everybody around was kind of like, what are you going to use all these spindles for? Like, w w what, do you have a spindle school or something? And I was like, yes, I have a spindle school. I'm like, come on. <laughs> yeah. That's like eating with a fork school. Right? <laughs> no, but I do. And this has actually been one of the things that has been really cool about what's come out of a, a lot of uh, the the need to do more things virtually, both you know here in Peru during this pandemic and everywhere in the world, right? And one of the things that it has meant is that, for example, I have been able to have my students of Indian backstrap weaving, for example, uh, post what they're doing and what they're learning on their own social media. And then my friends here and other weavers who I don't necessarily know, you know, look at Instagram or TikTok and, and they see these things and they're like, 
Well, okay, she's learning this the you know in the way that we would that we would like to see this be taught, right? And this mm -hmm. is in in the the workflow and the process, and and this is pretty cool. And wow, look, these these are folks who really respect what we're doing and so forth. And so it's it's fantastic. And then those folks are like, well, now I'm going to make a TikTok of how I do this warping technique. And so it 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 causes all this greater sharing of all of this this kind of stuff and it's really it's really very cool to see that kind of stuff happen but but yeah so do i have a favorite spindle um you know the one i'm using at the moment probably and that's no spindle right now since i'm you know under forced rest for my hand so mean and i could be i could be spinning one-handed long draw on an electric spinner which i also greatly enjoy doing um, I mean, I enjoy a whole lot of things, but I'm, I'm trying to be, you know, like, well-behaved-ish. Um, <laughs> genuinely attentive to that kind of stuff. So, uh, so yeah, so there's, there's been just a lot of, a lot of really cool things like that. So what do I, what do I, how do I pick a favorite spindle? I mean, I have moods too, right? Like, there's, there's, there's just so much to it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm running through our chat real quick to see if there are questions. Okay. Someone said they posted one further up. I'm looking to see if I can find it. Well, oh, folks are really, they're liking your, your uh, crochet project, your generational someone, okay. Beth, Rebecca, Rebecca Smith said, Oh my God, that's an amazing legacy project. Really, it is. I mean, it's just beautiful. Yeah, isn't it? And I mean, people talk about stash acquisition beyond life expectancy like it's a bad thing. But it has actually meant a lot to me to inherit stash and tools from people in my family who were users of those, right? And uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's it's incredibly meaningful. It's mm -hmm. it's really intense. And so I I don't I don't have that like negativity about having stash. That, that a lot of people do. I also want to say early in the lockdowns in Peru, and the lockdowns here were very hard. Like you, you couldn't go outside. Like I spent more than three months where I didn't set foot out the door of my house and only one member of our household was allowed to go out and only on Tuesdays and Thursdays and only to the markets that were only open on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And other than that, you had, uh, and only during certain hours and you know, only if masked and with you know, mm -hmm. alcohol and everything. Um, and, and, you know, the police and the military were out there telling you, being like, you know, hey, kids, get back inside. I don't care if your ball came out, like, over the wall, you know, wait for us to come around and we'll toss it back in. But wow. no, no getting out in the streets. Anyway, during that span of time, in order to travel from, uh, like, you know, one town to another for essential things, you needed to get a pass that your local government, your town government would issue that said you had permission to cross township lines and go into the next township and um and Oyante Tambo ran completely out of unused yarn because everyone was stuck at home too so what are you going to do right so everybody ran out of yarn and this was a major crisis it was a major crisis we yeah. ran out of yarn do you understand what I'm saying we ran out of yarn like <laughs> that would be terrible and and it wasn't like shearing season or anything either because it was coming into winter and everyone was like what are we going to do like <laughs> How do we, how do we even, and basically, you know, people listen to a lot of music and, and, uh, and, and danced and argued with each other and were generally crabby, right? Like all over town. And then finally, like occasionally, like somebody would get a pass, like my niece got a pass to go to Urubamba for some, for some, uh, some medical supplies, uh, from the clinic near the main market. And surreptitiously, this one lady who had a store in her house with yarn and it was selling yarn. And so my niece scored yarn and brought it back and we're like, yes, thank God. You know, like, <laughs> right? So, uh, so it's, it's true. It's true what the, you know, what the uh, stereotypical hippie potheads used to say, I think, which is that stash will get you through times of no money better than money will get you through times of stash. Um, <laughs> And I think I think the same thing is true about yarn, and so yeah. So if my heirs inherit my yarn projects and, and so on and so forth, I I believe that generally speaking, that that those heirs will be like, man, this is cool. This this was Tia Abby's, you know, 
uh, yarn project that I guess now I'm going to have to do something with because it makes me think of her or whatever. And I think that's, I think, I think that's cool. But yeah, think how, think how powerful it is. I, I somewhat doubt that my great grandma May in 1896 truly thought that long into 21st century, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, the great granddaughter she had that she had no idea would exist was going to be the holder of that project. Yeah, and, and I also loved what my mom said when she said, "And I, so now I guess it's your turn to not finish it." <laughs> no pressure. Right. Right. Yeah. Abby, we've got a question here from Stevie Miller. She says, "In your book, you mentioned a Nordic lap spindle." I've looked everywhere for these and can't find them pictured or referenced. Are they shaped and used similarly to Navajo spindles? Where can I learn more about them? Um, I would have to go look for specifically where I mentioned that and which specific ones, uh, which specific ones. Uh, generally speaking, the spindles I have seen that are that are like that, um, that are like large supported spindles in the Navajo style, although most of them, unless it is actually made by Navajo or Diné people, it is not a Navajo spindle. It could be in that style, but it wouldn't actually be called that. Um, the Nordic style ones have often been high whirl and, uh, and rolled on the lap and, um, and, and the, the twisting happens sort of above the whirl that's in your lap. Uh, I, I would have to look around and see if I can find some pictures and some other kinds of stuff. Um, I do I do try to do this. And actually, at Frankmont University, when we have office hours, uh, those are times where people bring their questions. And sometimes their, their research questions are stuff where I have to go dig things up and then come back with them and a lot of that kind of stuff. So that's uh, that's that's stuff folks might, might be interested to know. So finding pictures of those. Um, I don't have any to hand right here right now that I that I know of, but I can look through uh, some of my archives and so forth. Um, but I don't have any to pull out right this second. But they are they're sort of like the inverse of the large floor spindle, and they tend to be held in your lap in general. Um, I haven't seen a lot of them in easily ten years, and before that, they were sort of not as common anymore either. And this is one of the sort of interesting things about spindles too, is that they, they come and go in terms of popularity and, and what's in and what's what's considered cool. And uh, uh, it's, it's really very interesting. Also, a lot of the mythos about spindles that comes up tends to be where they're from, what they're for, and that kind of thing. And there is this sort of, um, there is this tendency to to draw a lot of conclusions about spindles uh, and where they're from and what they're used for and all of that that isn't necessarily accurate. And sometimes this happens because well-intentioned people are looking to find few words to say something and it needs to get edited down into uh, like a smaller number of words, right? So it fits in the available space or a lot of that. So you don't have an opportunity to clarify a lot of these kinds of things and then sometimes things get misunderstood or passed along and it's really interesting. Like at one point I had, uh, so at, at another point in respect to the spindle, I said that because most field archeologists are not trained textile experts, dot, dot, dot. And somebody misread it and claimed that I had said most field archeologists are trained textile experts, which is the opposite of what I had said, but then that got repeated in some mm. other places. And then um, people didn't go back and check the original source. And people are like, yeah, Abby Frankelmont thinks archaeologists are all textile people. No, we don't. I, I never said that. But it's really hard. Once things get out there and into the sort of popular information mm -hmm. sphere of things, combating that is really, really hard. And an example of that is the phrase Andean plying, which uh, my dad wrote a quick one pager for spinoff in like 1990, 91, I think it was published. Uh, and it was about this clever trick that my godmother uh, in Chinchero would use to deal with when she was plying, when she was winding a plying ball, which is a two stranded ball of yarn wound off from two spindles. Uh, and she would run out of yarn on one spindle and would want to use up what was in the rest of it. And she would wind this little quick clever thing and then splice the other end and finish winding her double-stranded plying ball for plying from. 
And uh, I, I was sitting there, I was like six or seven years old, and I was sitting there in the courtyard of that time and watched my godmother do this thing that we all knew how to do, right? You know, I certainly had been taught it as a, you know, part of my intervention program, you know, because winding yarn was something that I could do to be useful even when I was really bad at spinning. Anyway, and so my dad was like, what, what, did, you, what did you do that again? And my godmother was like, do what, Ed? And he said, that thing you just did with the, you know, and the breeze and the, do that thing again. I'm getting my camera. I'm going to just do it again. And she's like, so anyway, he, uh, he came back with the camera and the whole thing. He took these pictures and he took all these notes and he wrote this all down. He's like, this is ingenious. This is really ingenious. But uh, then he never had like a, it, it was just this small thing, right? So he never had like a venue that it was going to end up in or anything like that. And then somehow it ended up in whatever issue of spinoff it was in, I think, 1991. And the title of that article was An Andean Flying Technique. So this was a trick that my godmother used and some other people used, you know, it's kind of a common throwaway, get to both ends of a piece of yarn that's like longer than just your arm span. Um, but it's not like how people actually ply yarn in the Andes, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, so then lo and behold, a couple of years went by and, uh, and somebody on a, an internet mailing list that I was on said, I need some help with Andean plying. And I answered, talking about how yarn actually is plied in the Andes. And the big thing is that it's this uh, handle of the spindle that sets it in motion and a lot of that kind of stuff. And uh, people replied to me and said, I have no idea what you're talking about, but it's not Andean plying. And I'm like, okay, well, let's back up. And, and what do you think Andean plying is? And someone's like, you know the thing and you wrap it and then like you cut off the circulation to your finger and then you can't take it off, but then you do the... And I'm like, that's just a yarn winding trick. Like that's not even like plying necessarily. And they're like, well, Ed Frankemont says it is. <laughs> and I'm like, hold up. Wait, everybody on this mailing list, wait right here. So I call my dad and I'm like, Ed, you said what? And he's like, no, that is not what I said. It's in the spinoff issue. And they just, and now everybody is calling it Indian plying. And I'm like, but they're being wrong, like all over the internet. You should go like fix that. And he's like, good luck with that. Right. Um, and, you know, ha ha, very funny, but here it is 30 years later and I still haven't succeeded in getting people to change their opinion about what that term means. Even though here, all my Andean friends are like, oh my God, how have you not fixed this yet? <laughs> like, uh, you know, uh, they all think that's how we ply all our yarn. And I'm like, I, I know. I've Like, I've even tried making, I've even tried like telling them that they're Ringo plying from Lazy Kate's with spinning wheels. And they're like, and that doesn't even work. And I'm like, no, like people are just, they're, they're, they're saying the thing and it's there. And so, you know, mythos gets out and it gets around and all that kind of stuff. And there's a lot of things that, that are, that are sort of like that. And so the terminology evolves and changes and all of this kind of stuff. And it's so, it's so interesting. So mm -hmm. interesting. So many opinions. It is it really is. Well, let me take you a slightly different direction because mm -hmm. Regina Bowley Sweeten had a question. She said mm -hmm. she is having problems with tendonitis that can interrupt her spindling. What do you recommend for hand spindling health? Girl, me too. Right. Um, <laughs> No, so there are there are a lot of things, and actually we have a um, we we ran a whole focused interest group uh, thing at Frankmont University talking about comfort and spinning and not damaging your body and a whole lot of this. But so some really big things are um, never be death gripping. So I'm going to use my good hand to show this as opposed to my bad ouchy hand so much. So uh, like it's not you know my my th my tendonitis is like so so unfun. It's not necessarily because of spinning. But, you know, tendonitis happens. So the key thing is notice that I am like not locking my thumb joint. Let's see, I'm trying to make this visible here. Not locking my thumb joint. So I'm not doing that. I'm not locking it. And I'm holding very lightly. And so one exercise that I do is I'll, I will pass a piece of paper back and forth between thumb and forefinger and learning how to use all of my hand to do things and, and grip stuff. And you can see that this hand has some swelling right now because I'm not supposed to be doing a whole lot with it. I'm supposed to be on principled rest, but like being very gentle and making sure that like, you're not watching 
the color of your nail bed change. You're not seeing things be like crushing and pinching and working on focusing on uh, much lighter technique. And another thing is taking frequent breaks. I hate taking breaks. It's so stupid. And another thing is um, another thing is to do a lot of stretches. And so like you want to make sure that you are stretching your hands, but you know, carefully. Um, and doing a lot of that kind of stuff. So I can show that with, with this hand. So like I stretch back, I stretch forward, um, I stretch my thumbs, I stretch my individual fingers in different directions. And I do a lot of uh, this kind of exercise to sort of keep things limber, but not and to build strength and to do all of that kind of stuff. But the number one thing to do pisses me off. <laughs> when it hurts, stop. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants to though, right? No, 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 it, it <laughs> fills me with rage. It totally fills me with rage, right? And like my orthopedic medicine, uh, you know, sports rehab guy you know, works with football here. That's, it's called football everywhere in the world, except in the USA where they call it soccer and they call something else football. Um, but, uh, but uh, so he works with like, you know, those kinds of uh, athletic teams and the whole thing. And he has to do the same thing with, you know, with, with like skilled athletes and be like, if, if it hurts, you do actually need to stop and you need to like rest and condition and do your physical therapy and do all this kind of stuff. And it's really terrible. Um, and so like when he started, when he told me that I have, uh, this particular tendonitis that I've got, and he said the specific movements that I can't do, I'm looking at him in disbelief and he's like, ha ha, cause, cause you teach spinning and weaving. And I'm like, I know it's not funny. And he's like, yeah, you're gonna have to find some other ways, like for about six weeks that I want you to be resting this, um, um, pending some other kinds of things. And I'm like, that's a lifetime. And he's like, no, it's not. It is a drop in the bucket of being able to keep doing this until you're 80, 90, 100. Mm -hmm. and yes, he's right. It's hard, but he's right. I know. What a dick. <laughs> like, you know, being right, like doctors being right. I just, um, you know, pardon my French. Yeah, it's frustrating. It is. So it's we are, we're at 310. Okay. Anything else you want to share with folks okay. today? Before we yeah. I wanted to say um, we put together so uh, so my uh, my whole my whole crew and I at Frankmont University uh, we're working on a bunch of different things and we didn't finish as much of it as we wanted to but we are just today and this week announcing what our year end trimester we work in trimesters which is to say four months at a time um, what our year end trimester consists of and so forth and so I was gonna we were gonna give everybody who watches this a 10% off coupon for your cool. first for your first subscri subscription session. Uh, so you can sign up at abbeysyarns.com. And even if you don't want to sign up, you can join our Discord at abbeysyarns.com and part of our whole social scene talking about spinning and weaving and yarn addiction and other random stuff. Like you can also talk about cooking or armchair travel or your pets or, you know, total frustrations or, um, you know, gripes and woes and joys and, uh, and uh, all kinds of things like that. And um, we, we are just finishing up for our mid-year trimester. We had a big focus on teaching spinning and how to teach spinning which there's a whole lot of. And so we just went through our core fundamentals curriculum again with a major focus on how to teach it and present it. And so we have some of our advanced students will be presenting the Frankemont method and working with that, uh, um, which is very exciting and stuff that we worked on. But so let me tell you what's coming up for the year end trimester. <clears throat> we've been plotting and planning and we've come up with a schedule for the year end trimester. And we already let it slip that we will be shenanigating in December. What is shenanigating? Well, we have shenanigans. The Frankemont Fiber Shenanigans, it stands for F, you know, the FFS stands for Frankemont Fiber Shenanigans, among other things potentially. Um, we are lighthearted and irreverent at Frankemont University, it should be known. Um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, the code is WW all capital, capital W, capital W, 10, lowercase off, WW, 10 off. Um, <clears throat> anyway, shenanigans, the Frankemont Fiber shenanigans happens periodically, and it is a set of collaborative and individual, you pick, challenges to do interesting things that are, you know, shenanigans, fiber shenanigans. So we've had uh, a lot of different interesting projects, like 
we've had what's the thickest yarn you can spin that actually everybody agrees qualifies as a yarn from 10 grams of yarn. So it's like the opposite of thinnest yarn. Um, and uh, what is the, uh, what can you do making yarn from stuff that isn't fiber intended to spin into yarn? What is, uh, uh, what are some interesting, making cordage from grass and other materials that you may find that are naturally occurring? Um, lots of different interesting stuff that, that we've done. Um, really interesting, cool things. We had like uh, stupid spinning stunts one time and uh, like Sasha spun while hanging upside down from a trapeze and like, you know, I mean, we've had some like really cool stuff like that people that people have done and, uh, and Ellen spun in the Swiss Alps using a Swiss army knife for a spindle. Uh, that was really spectacular, a lot of that. So that's happening in December. And there are there are always prizes, really cool prizes for shenanigating, for participating in shenanigans. So anyway, in September, we will be doing mastering short draw. So there are a lot of questions people have about short draw, which is, you know, uh, drafting shorts. Some people call it inchworm and a lot of that kind of stuff. And for some people, it's comfortable. For some people, it's uncomfortable. For some people, it's the natural default thing, but they don't get the yarn that they always want um, and a lot of different things. And some people find that it is painful and uncomfortable. And so, you know, to break things up into all kinds of excitement at the very first opportunity, once I am, you know, allowed to spin again with my bad ouchy hand, uh, we're gonna be mastering short bra and talking about a lot of the different ways of controlling your fiber for uh, those different methodologies and different approaches and pr perspectives and beliefs about that. And uh, this is follow that's following on from our spinning one through four series. So that's been a major focus that a lot of students have really wanted to, to do. So I mean, we tend to develop and program based on what our student body is really, is really interested in. And you also have access to the prior catalog um, of a number of things with a membership and then some other stuff is, some other courses are available for individual purchase as well. Uh, so there's a whole lot of real detail about mastering short draw. Then we have, we're doing it again uh, by popular demand, and this one was a, this one, this, this is a big deal. Uh, in February, we debuted online Andean backstrap weaving, um, and this was, this was, it was, it was very well received. It was a very intensive class and a whole lot to be done, and we ran it only for people who have already been members for like a month so that they know how to like go to the right place to watch classes and how to participate in office hours and to do all that kind of stuff. So uh, so we're going to run Andean Backstrap uh, 101, the intro for beginners. So we're running it again and um, we're going to be using some of our material recorded in February and there will be extra live sessions with the adjunct professors um, working on redoing like a whole lot of that kind of stuff and uh, materials are going to be in the U.S. and available for shipment in September um, because it, we work with materials actually made by the youth program at the Center for Traditional Textiles of Cusco um, so that they are made exactly to the appropriate specifications and so that you are working with the same methodology that is really used here for teaching people. This was a really interesting set of logistical challenges and we think we, think we have it mostly nailed now. Um, we're pretty sure. And uh, uh, so that's gonna be running um, again in September so that in October we can move into Andean Backstrap 110, no longer the 101 class, but the, uh, the 110 class for everyone who has completed the 101 and is ready to move into the next set of things. And I want to, I want to just say our, our, uh, our written description here, which is actually really good, thank you adjunct professors, is Andean Backstrap Weaving for Beginners. Due to overwhelming demand, we are rerunning the most popular Francomont University class so far. The course is based on material recorded in February with extra live sessions with our adjunct professors, and you will learn to weave basic three pair patterns, how to wind and set up a warp ready for weaving, as well as the proper terminology and information about suitable yarn to use, and you'll go away with many different patterns to practice with. It's actually aimed at making you independently able to do uh, all of that introductory, truly traditional Andean backstrap weaving stuff, and to be able to interact, you know, on Instagram or TikTok with Andean backstrap weavers in the Andes and all that kind of stuff too. You can like actually really do that. Students are actually really doing that. Um, anyway, and then finally, and then finally in November, we have spinning sweater quantities. Uh, 
After seeing Discord discussions and plans from people intending to spin for a sweater, we decided to dedicate an entire month to it, helping you plan and execute your sweater spin along alongside the Frankmont University uh, community. And also in November, we will be running a focused interest group on spinning for Andean weaving, which is a few folks have been making their traditional Andean weaving yarn, and we will be running a focused interest group uh, diving deep into that. Um, so there are also other focused interest group sessions in the works and a lot of focused interest groups that have already happened where you can review the past recorded sessions and videos and then participate on the chat channels uh, talking about all that kind of stuff and engage on an ongoing basis around the clock, wherever you are, all of that good fun stuff. And like I say, we presently for everybody watching Wooly Wednesday, listening to Wooly Wednesday, checking it out anytime in August. We do have that discount code for you of 10% off your first session. Um, your membership is either monthly as a sustaining member or uh, full trimester, which is four months at a time, which is also a little bit discounted. And then also you can get 10% off it for an even bigger discount. Um, that And that'll be running the, uh, the, the discount for uh, full trimester membership is only going to be in August, and the discount on uh, sustaining membership, which is recurring monthly, is uh, going to run through September. So, there. You got a lot of great stuff planned. I well, really... that's what we're doing these days. It's really important to us to keep this community going, right? And mm -hmm. um, yeah, we have a lot of stuff planned. It is. Yeah. It is. A there's a lot there. It's it's a lot for forty five dollars a month, or you know, five uh, ten percent off, five bucks off. Yeah, your, your first session. So the um, I, I wish I'd done things in a different order. I just you know the um, spinning for a sweater, that so many folks could have used that. We we did a challenge with Deb Robes in the beginning of the year. It was our first sweater challenge. We had a, over a hundred people sign up for it, and there were some questions like, "How do I know how much to spin? How long is it going to take me to spin for an entire sweater? I've never spun for a sweater before." That it takes been... somewhere between two days and seven years, <laughs> right? Is that a general experience? Yeah. But yeah. So I mean, there's 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 a whole lot there, right? There's a lot of really interesting stuff and and everything and. And you do, like I say, you know, get to participate in all of these in all of these things. It's a lot of it's a lot of what's so much fun. Um, but uh, yeah, if you're just thinking about it, we encourage you to join our Discord. Which, if you go to abbeysyarns.com and you look under the interact uh, heading, there's something that says chat, and you would just click that, and that'll tell you all about Discord and what it is and how it works and a whole lot of that kind of stuff. Because it isn't obvious to everybody how it works, and so it's really. It's really useful, but it's awesome to have this, you know, twenty four seven worldwide community. That's mm -hmm. the stuff, and yeah, we're we are constantly working on doing stuff. And I actually, I think the thing that we are doing the least awesome job at is probably telling everybody that we're here doing all this cool stuff. Probably mostly because we're so busy doing the cool stuff that mm -hmm. um, that maybe that's where we fall down a little bit. Yeah, well, I'm glad we were able to spread the word a little bit today while you were here. Me too. There was a whole bunch of other stuff I was I thought I'd, I'd tell you too, you know, and we just didn't get to it, so. It happens. Well, we might have to have you on again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to be persuaded, maybe. Yeah. If folks All are. Right. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. We've had a lot of viewers today, so, and a lot of positive feedback. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up. And if you are viewing a Wooly Wednesday for the first time and are not yet familiar with our Shave Em to Save Em initiative and are curious about spinning, weaving, crocheting, knitting, dyeing rare wool, endanger, wool from endangered breeds of sheep here in the US and beyond, um, visit us at www.rarewool.org. That's R-A-R-E-W-O-O-L.org. And you can get all of the details. And if you want to challenge yourself, you can sign up, get yourself a passport, and uh, start shopping for a larger stash. <laughs> Abby, thank you so much for joining us today. It was really great to meet you. Thank you. Likewise, I really had a great time. Yeah, this was wonderful. I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of your afternoon. And come check us out next month. It's always the second Wednesday of the second full week, excuse me, of the month. We'll post it on Facebook again. Give me a little reminder ahead of time that 
yeah, check our Woolly Wednesdays. And all of these Woolly Wednesdays, if you missed any of the past ones, are available on our YouTube channel. Um, I do not have a banner here I can throw up for that, but our YouTube channel is the Livestock Conservancy. So just go to YouTube and search Livestock Conservancy and you will find a whole Shave Them to Save Them playlist with our previous Wooly Wednesdays. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your day.